I'm very excited to introduce our next two speakers, Susan Hillow and Sue Hubbard. Susan Hillow is a pioneer of the marathon project. She was in the 2006 marathon, actually, with uh, Rem Kohlhaas. Her work has been described as an archaeology of the unconscious of our culture and is exhibited globally. She was born in the United States and is based in London. Her many books include The Provisional Texture of Reality, 2008, and Auras and Levitations, Homage to Marcel Duchamp, Homage to Yves Klein, in 2008. Suzanne will introduce um, Sue Hubbard, and it's part of the many, many dialogues Susan Hiller has with poets. Um, uh, Sue Hubbard uh, has written on Susan's work, so they had many, many conversations. Sue Hubbard is a freelance art critic, a novelist, and an award-winning poet. Her publications include many books, the poetry volumes Everything Begins with the Skin in 94, Ghost Station in 2004, the novel Depth of Field in 2000, as well as a short story collection, Rothko's Red, in 2008. She writes regularly also on contemporary art for a variety of publications. A very, very warm welcome to Susan Hiller and to Sue Hubbard. I feel very honored to be here. I'm not a poet, and I really don't know what I'm doing here as one of the people on the podium, but I've come really to introduce Sue Hubbard, um, who in fact is probably already known to a lot of you, and anyway, Hans Ulrich has said most of the things I was going to say, but Sue Hubbard is a very fine poet, and a very fine poet who has a very particular relationship to contemporary art practice. Uh, many poets write about art, but very few of them actually are involved in contemporary art in the way that Sue is. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things that she's done, which may sort of, I don't know, amplify that a little bit. Um, she writes about art, and she writes about art quite regularly for um, newspapers like The Independent and magazines such as The New Statesman. These are really um, essays on art. She also reviews art um, for leading international art magazines, and I, I believe some of these texts are going to be anthologized quite soon, but I don't have all the details of that. And interestingly enough, Sue Hubbard was the um, Poetry Society's first ever public art poet. You know that public art is a genre that's quite controversial for very many reasons. So it's very interesting that she took on that role as a poet and produced poetry in public in several different situations. For example, recent, more, most recently, I think, um, she produced a work that was commissioned by the Arts Council and the British Film Institute that many of you will have seen, perhaps not knowing the name of the author. It's a very, very big uh, installed poem, I suppose I would call it, in the, um, the, the underpass between Waterloo and um, the IMAX cinema. It's, um, it was commissioned to sort of liven up that very dark and kind of hostile environment. And Sue's poem takes up the entire length of the tunnel. And appropriately, uh, because it is in a sort of subterranean setting, her poem is called Eurydice, or as I think it's pronounced in this country, Eurydice. And Time Out doesn't often <clears throat> mention poetry, but they did recently write about Sue's piece, and they called it the best reason to linger and a haunting enticement to return to that underworld of that tunnel. As I said, Sue Hubbard is a very fine poet, and I'm very honored to introduce her today. Thank you, Susan, for a very generous um, introduction. It's really particularly nice to have Susan introduce me because I've long admired her work and that is what's so special about being here, that one has these um, ongoing dialogues between artists and writers. I'm not a performance poet, 
I'm a lyrical poet, but I write a lot about art, and some people have said that, in many ways, my poems resemble paintings. I shan't say much more about that. It's really up to you to decide. But the first two poems, I feel it's a bit like I'm sort of going to bless you all standing here. I don't feel... Um, I don't terribly like this lectern, actually. Um, thank you. Sorry, if I, if it feels like giving a lecture, and I'm not giving a lecture. The first two poems are taken from paintings, paintings that you'll both that you'll all know, and um, this is nude in the bathtub um, after Bonnard. The one thing you might not know, but most of you, being arty people, will, is that. Um, Bonnard's wife was neurasthenic, which is why he painted her endlessly in the bath. And the thing that touched me about this was that he took a long time to do this painting, and she never grows any older, and he was still working on it when she died. Nude in bathtub after Bonnard. Between the edge of the afternoon and dusk, between the bath's white rim and the band of apricot light. She bathed, each day as if dreaming. From the doorway he noted her right foot, hooked for balance beneath the enamel lip, body and water, all one in a miasma of mist, a haze of lavender blue. Such intimacy a woman, two walls, a checkered floor, the small curled dog basking in a pool of sun reflected from the tiles above the bath, outside the throbbing heat. So many times he has drawn her, caught the obsessive soaping of her small breasts compress the crouch frame into his picture space, the nervy movements that hemmed in his life. The house exudes her still, breathes her from each sunlit corner, secretes her lingering smell from shelves of rosewood armoire and folded silk chemise. He doesn't have the heart to touch. And from the landing, his memory tricks as through the open door the smudged floor glistens with silver tracks. Her watered footprints to and from the tub where she floats in almond oil deep in her sarcophagus of light. The next one comes from a very different generation of painters. Um, this is uh, based um, on a painting by Edward Hopper. And the language is very different. I wanted to catch something in the painting of the Edward, in the language of the Edward Hopper painting. And it's called Room in New York, 1932, after Edward Hopper. Her dress is red. Her bare arms white as soured cream. Her hair is malt and softly looped behind the long arc of her pale neck. In the half shadow, she scans the page of her book, her face the color of bruised plums, then sighs and turns towards the lamp, which has a shade, the same faded red as her dress. His shirt is white. His buttoned waistcoat and knotted tie are black. He has taken off his jacket in the heat and opened the window onto the sticky night. He sits in a pink velvet chair, his face inclined towards his newspaper, as sometimes he might incline it towards a kiss. 
Their bowed heads form a diagonal across the room, though her chin is tilted to the right and his to the left. There is nothing between them except a small, round, maplewood table set with a lace cloth. The table is polished and shimmers like a lake, but it is not a lake. It is simply a table that sits between them, just as the walls, which are yellow as illness, are just walls. Somewhere down the hall, a door slams. Well, having mentioned the poem in the tunnel, I sort of feel obliged to read it. And um, it was commissioned to make people feel better about going down in the tunnel. And um, I came up with the image of Eurydice or Eurydice. Um, and you can go and see it, and I'm rather touched that it hasn't been violated in all the years that it's been there. I am not afraid as I descend, step by step, leaving behind the salt wind blowing up the corrugated river, the damp city streets, the sodium glare of rush hour headlights pitted with pearls of rain. For my eyes still reflect the half-remembered moon. Already your face recedes behind the station clock, a damp smudge among the shadows mirrored in the train's wet glass. Will you forget me? Steel tracks lead you out past cranes and crematoria, Boat yards and bike sheds, ruby shards of Roman glass and wolf bone mummified in mud, the rows of curtain windows like eyelids, heavy with sleep to the city's green edge. Now I stop my ears with wax, hold fast the memory of the song you once whispered in my ear. Its echoes tangle like briars in my thick hair. You turn to look. Seconds fly past like birds. My hands grow cold. I am ice and cloud. This path unravels deep in hidden rooms filled with dust and sour night breath. The lost city is sleeping. Above the heart sky is weeping. Soaked nightingales have ceased to sing. Dusk has come too early. I am drowning in blue. I dream of a green garden where the sun feathers my face like your once eager kiss. Soon, Soon I will climb from this blackened earth into the diffident light. This next um, poem is the title poem of the collection. Um, I was um, doing a residency up in Scotland, in Roslyn. That's where, you know, Dolly the Sheep came from. But um, I was walking through the woods I'm sure artists must do the same, but uh, as a poet, if you can't write, walk, <laughs> and something sometimes happens. And I was walking through these woods in Scotland, and I found these strange platforms in the middle of woods, which I realized belonged with the old platforms of a little branch line station. And the tracks weren't there, just, just the platforms, really in the middle of nowhere. So this is the poem. Ghost Station. Wild garlic and rain in the woods, and between invisible tracks that lead from here to there, I sense them glide through their lost narratives down platforms of damp ferns. Think 
of a bent hairpin lodged for years under a wooden carriage seat, fallen from a stook of auburn hair, a single collar stud trapped beneath the floor that once fastened small intimacies behind a film of beaded glass, or an old man's knotted hand, knuckles raw in the niche of his lap, carrying home a gift of speckled eggs. Imagine the pallor of rain, ashen, pewter, stained watery sheen along a black bone of glinting steel and shadows of coal dust, steam and sparks on iron where green tongues of larkspur grow. Turn your head and glimpse between verticals of larch and beech, blotched autobiographies like smudged footprints in wet grass. Listen where the wind throws back its dialogue of despair behind the raindrops, acknowledges lives drained away like a plume of smoke recalled along invisible tracks by a damp bird's solitary song. This um, next one is, I suppose, um, a love poem. That's what poets do write love poems. But um, uh, as I've often said when I've been introducing love poems, I don't think one ever really writes love poems. One writes after love poems, I think. you know, At the time, you're too busy doing it. But uh, afterwards, you have plenty of time. So. But it is also, I think, quite painterly, and it makes a reference to drawing in the poem. And it's set on the North Norfolk coast. It's called Blakeney. A single wooden skiff lies beached among the reeds out beyond the estuary's tidal reach. Lair upon weathered layer of paint, a palimpsest in blue peeling like exmed skin, its hull a bleached cage of ribs rotting in brackish water. We've come east to where the horizon's a mere line of penciled light and brindled skies squat above the fens to mend what you refuse to, cannot name, as if in the merging of sky, land, reeds, these beginnings and ends, something might be permeable beneath this waning light. For in the afternoon, and the November dusk closes in the long horizons, shadows the corrugated spit of sunlit sand as we taste the smoke of early evening on our lips. You walk ahead, and already I know you are slipping from me, as this small trapped craft must once have slipped from a surf wet key. Oh, love, what I want to say is look. The tide is turning and ref the tide is turning, turning and refilling these salt pans as the chambers of an empty heart endlessly pour and fill. Pour and spill. This next one follows on from that. And the metaphor of it throughout, it is very much a love poem, and the, the metaphor through it is a rope. Rope. Sometimes in the small hours, alone now in my too big bed, I close my eyes and remember how we made love and knew 
entering me from behind as my hands disappeared in front of me in the whiteness of pillows, like a child's buried deep in a new drift of snow, and my hair a dark wave falling across the beach of my back and how you grabbed it, the whole length and hank of it, into a rope, so my head was pulled back, my face tilted upwards like the carved figure on the prow of a ship, where the wind and salt spray stung my bare skin, and how, sometimes then, I imagine years hence, that you would twine the now silver-streaked coil hauling me in across deep water as a fisherman draws in his small catch to land a shimmering catch on the stone quay, slipping the wet rope in a figure of eight through the heavy metal ring in a double hitch, as if securing me fast, as if never wanting to let me go. The final two poems that um, I'm going to read um, will be published in um, the new year. It's a collaboration with um, an Irish artist who we were both um, doing a residency on the extreme west coast of Ireland. And it, anybody who's been there, it literally is the edge of Europe. It's mostly visual artists. I've been very lucky to go there several times. And they're, they're studios, and it's a famine village. And when I look out from the, my little bed up in the loft, all I can see is two little islands in the distance across the sea, a lighthouse, and then it's America. And these islands became almost a metaphor for me, um, because you can't get to them. And so, I call this poem The Idea of Islands, and in a way it's about all those things that we idealize and can't ever get to. The Idea of Islands. The candle in its glass stutters, reflected back fourfold in the panes of this small window. Though tonight there is no moon, only an endless sea, black as a saucer of spilt ink, and waves crested with white horses stretching into the far distance like light, streaking, streaking the surface of a dark negative. I know that out there, there is not nothing, for my mind recalls the idea of islands and how in the early morning mist, high above the boiling sea, mercury clouds can part suddenly as quicksilver to reveal a radiant light. Though I have been here before, I now understand something of the compulsion of departure and return, how love must be a surrender, a letting go of that dark grieving lodged in marrow bone, and how life is only this moment at midnight, a guttering candle and a terrible wind howling across a strait of wide water, like something lost in the anthracite dark, beating its way home in the battering rain. Fine, thanks. That's all. Thank you.